welcome everyone and um, as always we are very excited to um, have you all here today uh, if you do not know me my name is Ekaterina Stoops and I work as the e-learning faculty development coordinator here at CityU and today our topic for our workshop is accessibility and responsiveness in online education and we will examine ways you can make your classes more accessible for your students. Um, as you all know, our workshops are interactive um, and during the session you will also have lots of opportunities to participate in discussions and share your ideas. So um, before we begin our presentation, let's go over some house rules for this session. So uh, to participate in our discussions, you can use the chat and just type your comments and questions in chat, or you can use your microphone and um, participate that way. We actually highly encourage you to use your microphones because we love hearing your voices. Uh, if for some reason you can't, you don't have a microphone, you can always call in the session by using uh, an option um, use your phone for audio there is an icon uh, up at the top that looks like a menu if you click on that icon just choose use your phone for audio and then you will be able to connect via phone um, but then uh, when you're using your mics and when you're not speaking please turn them off because we can hear everything that is going on uh, in your room so it's that background noise that we uh, we want to avoid if you have any technical issues during the session um, again you can use the chat and just let us know and we'll uh, help you troubleshoot and now I would like to introduce our presenter uh, Presley Rankin. Um, Presley is the Associate Professor and Academic Program Director at City University of Seattle. He has been teaching in both online and in-person teaching environments for over five years. Uh, from a course design perspective, Presley focuses on creating engaging classes that have clear boundaries and exemplify the best practices in both course design and universal design. And Presley always wants to have um, to make his classes fun for his students. Okay, and I will turn it to Presley now. Hi everyone. Thank you, Katrina, for that warm introduction. Um, tonight we are going to be talking about accessibility and responsiveness in online education. Um, this is the second time we've done this webinar. We did one earlier in the week. Um, I kind of ran out of time, so this time I'm going to try to be much more succinct in my presentation, realizing that we have only about um, 45 minutes. So. This webinar is really designed to kind of give you some ideas about what accessibility is, what can you do in your classroom that are easy fixes to help your classroom become more, more um, accessible, and then how can you communicate with your students in a, a way that not only makes them feel included in this part of the classroom, but also helps them to feel that you are um, caring about their needs and working with them in that way. So, Initially, let's just talk about what accessibility means. Um, that term is used a lot, but in this context, we're basically meaning a person that um, has a disability that is a that has afforded the same is afforded the same opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, enjoy the same services as a person without a disability. So. Really, the idea here is that somebody comes into your classroom and they should be able to access everything that um, you um, have without having to ask for special permission or a special format to be given to them. So, in other words, they, need to, they should be able to come in and um, ask for, um, they should be able to come in and work in the class just like anyone else could. So when we're talking about online classes, we're talking about people who could be in your class that have visual impairments, hearing impairments, motor impairments, or cognitive impairments. Um, they could be a little ADHD like I am and have trouble focusing in on really um, long, complicated um, documents or instructions that are overly long. 
um, small fonts, those kind of things can also tend to make people have problems. Up to 20% of Americans have some kind of disability at some level of disability. And that's where we really want to talk about the spectrum, this continuum, because not everybody, when you, when, you, when you think disabled, some people immediately think of someone in a wheelchair or someone who's completely blind. But there's actually people that are, a that are on an ability continuum, meaning that maybe they can see some, but they can't see really well, or, or maybe they are only partially deaf, or maybe they can walk, but not at all occasions. Um, they may be able to communicate verbally, they may not be able to. They may have some ability to tune out distraction, but it may not. They, you can never know exactly where they're, they're falling on this continuum. Some people who have really bad arthritis, they have trouble typing and writing for any long periods of time. So these are all considered things that could make you unable to participate fully in a class, depending on how the professor sets that class up. One of the things that we're going to talk about really quickly um, is making sure that your documents that you put online are accessible. And when you're talking about your documents, you're talking about PD, PDFs, Word documents, and PowerPoints. Um, a lot of professors like to put their lectures up, their lecture notes up, maybe outlines for the students to see how to do an assignment. Or a PowerPoint lecture is a very good way to communicate information to students. However, if this lectures or these um, documents are just Word documents, they don't have a voice component, it can be hard for students, especially students who are using an e-reader um, because they are unable to read um, because of the visual impairment, then it's hard for these students to navigate your documents and navigate your classroom. So you want to be sure to be aware of how you're making your classroom and your documents accessible. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a video where um, they go over some of the tools that you have in Microsoft in order to make your Microsoft documents more accessible. And these tools will go over to um, your a PDF. If you convert the PDF through Microsoft, it will continue to bring over those, um, those documents and things. Now, I tried this last time, and it didn't work as well, but I think it's going to work this time. It may take a minute for me to adjust the sound, so just give me a minute to adjust the sound. Um, but I also have closed captions on so that you can listen to it as well. And this is going to talk about the accessibility authoring tools in Microsoft. Today I'm going to show you new capabilities on Office 365 to help you easily create accessible content. These include accessible templates on Office for PCs and Macs, auto-generated descriptions for images and titles for hyperlinks, as well as how Word for Mac now creates accessible PDFs. In Office 365, we're making it easier for you to ensure your content is usable by people with disabilities. Let's start with PowerPoint. Accessible templates are a great way to get started. A simple search for accessible returns all of the templates that we've recently upgraded for accessibility. Today, I want to make a business plan, so let me add that to the scope of my search. This plan looks good. Let me open it and show you what exactly makes it accessible. To do this, I'm going to switch to the slide outline view so you can see how every slide here has a unique title. As I update the text, the labeling and the formatting is automatically taken care of, making this deck easy to navigate for someone who is a keyboard user and a screen reader user. For example, this slide, every element is easy to navigate using a keyboard because we have thought through tab order. Similarly, in this slide, if I open a screen reader called Narrator, you can hear how it's read out to someone who's blind. Volume mute. Title text box. Editing. Content placeholder 5. Chart. Cluster column. Bar chart shows cost analysis, with y-axis displaying expenditure in currency and x-axis indicating a respective category in which the amount was spent. Bar chart shows cost analysis. What you just heard narrator reading out is a description of this chart that was provided by the author in a field called alt text. Alt text is another field that we're making much easier to use. Let me show you a new service that we're designing to make alt text easier to use by opening a blank presentation and inserting a picture. Now, when I right click on this image and select automatic alt text, I can generate a description for this image using our Cognitive Services API. In this case, the service 
figures out that this image is a group of people standing on a football field. If my intention for this image was different, I can alter this by typing some extra words. With machine learning, the service will keep improving the more that people use it. In addition to all text and the work we're doing with templates, we're also making it easier to work with hyperlinks and create accessible documents. Here, I have Word on my PC open. I'm working on a report. Notice that every heading in this paper is using the default styles that are built into Word. These are designed to be easy to navigate with a screen reader and have sufficient color contrast. In addition, if I insert a new hyperlink in any section of this document, I can use the link gallery, which shows me a list of most recently used files. When I insert a link from here, it automatically uses the file name as the display text. This is much more accessible than including a URL. One more thing I want to show you is the accessibility checker, now discoverable from the review tab. This scans my document and shows me any errors that might make it difficult for someone with a disability to use my document. Clicking on the error takes me to the place where the error has occurred, as well as shows me why to fix the error and how to fix it. It also gives me a link to learn more about this type of error. We've recently brought the accessibility checker to more PC apps, such as OneNote, and also to Office Web Apps and Office for Mac. Additionally, in Word for Mac, we're introducing a service to export a stacked PDF via Save As, so screen reader users can navigate exported documents by sections, understand images, and access hyperlinks. These are a few updates to help you author your files with accessibility in mind. We'll continue adding new capabilities to help advance digital inclusion. To stay up to date, search accessibility in Office Blog, and keep checking back to the Microsoft Mechanics Accessibility Okay, so that I think was a good little introductory video here. Let me go back to my slides now. Um, so what that showed or what that is talking about is that, you know, you can go into your documents and you can make them more accessible. Um, one of the great things about that presentation was you can see that how a screen reader is going to read the screen for, us, for um, a student who may be visually impaired. The screen reader looks for the styles that are chosen um, in order to read the screen. And that's, those styles can be set not only in the Word document like you saw here, but you can set them in Blackboard as well when you create items in Blackboard. And I'm going to show you that in just a few seconds. So. When you're doing online accessibility, you want to consider providing a logical layout, using titles to elements, using styles in Word or in Blackboard. If you use videos, you want to make sure they're captioned or have descriptive services. If it's not possible, then provide a written description or a narrative. So if you want to use a video and the video is not captioned, then you're going to need to sit there and kind of type out a summary of what was said um, so that students who are um, who cannot hear will have some kind of written description of what the video contained. Again, you don't want to make students have to ask you, oh, I can't hear, so please will you provide me a written text of this video that you're showing in your classroom. You don't want to put students in that situation where they're having to come to you and possibly embarrassing themselves or you know, making themselves stand out in the class when they really just want to be a part of your normal class. And even though this is 20% of the population, you may not know when a student is ha having these issues. So again, it's really a good idea just to make this a common practice that you have. When using diagrams, pictures, or other information, be sure you're filling in those alt tags. It takes just a couple of seconds to fill those in. Let's talk about a few more accessibility things here. Um, you want to limit the number of colors you're using in Blackboard. I know that everybody loves to put rainbow colors in their class and use different colors for everything. The truth is, is that makes your class much less accessible. Um, you want to make sure that your the colors that you use are high contrast and that the text or the material isn't isn't um, keyed to a color in case someone is colorblind. So you don't want to say, please see the red link below in order to do your assignment. Um, you know, don't go to the green link until tomorrow. You don't want to say things like that because, again, 
the student who's colorblind may not be able to see those colors. You want to make sure your fonts are readable. You want to make sure that you use a sans serif font like Arial. And you want to have the same font for all the content in your class. So if you're cutting and pasting from another document, check the font to be sure that you convert it to Arial so that you don't have series of different fonts. It's very distracting, especially to people who have obsessive compulsive disorder or who have ADHD. Um, having multiple different fonts can throw them off and make it impossible for them to read your, your work. Try to have multiple ways to learn, like videos, PowerPoints, articles, books, and have clear, distinct models, um, distinction in the models that are um, between what's required and uh, ah, modules. I fixed that, and I fixed it wrong. Have clear distinction in the modules in your um, Blackboard shell between what's required and unrequired. And it's good to put the unrequired content at the end, the extra content for the students, so that if they're using a screen reader or they're using some other kind of device, that they're not um, having to go through a bunch of unrequired resources to get to what they need to know. And it's always good to keep the students in the Blackboard shell. Um, I'm going to show you a little demonstration of that as well. We're going to do our demonstration now. The first thing I want to show you is using a um, a web checker from Web AIM, and I can put this um, link in the chat box, and I will do that as we speak. Um, this helps you to see if a color that you're using is high enough contrast. So you can see here, if you look at a typical color like red, which I know a lot of us use to call out assignments, the typical color for red it fails three of the four tests. The contrast ratio is way too low to be accessible. However, if you go to City U Burgundy, which is an official City U color, um, you're see, you can see that it passes all of the tests and it has a much higher contrast ratio. So if you're going to use accent colors, be sure that the colors are approved through um, what would be considered a high contrast model. And again, as they were saying in Microsoft, there are certain colors that they've already tested and found that are approved at the contrast level. But if you're going to try to use something on your own, be sure to check it out here. Now, what I'm going to show you now is um, one of the classrooms that we redesigned as part of the um, exemplary classroom redesign. And a lot of what you see here is things that we worked to try to make the class more accessible and to make the class easier for the students in or an organizational way, as well as in a um, as well as in uh, just from a stamp visual standpoint. One of the things we did is we created banners for this class. And the banners can be inserted by e-learning. Um, they can make you an overall banner for your class. They can't, make, they can't make different banners for different classes, but they can help you out with this process. If you get someone to help you make a banner, they can make sure to insert the banner so it is in the heading of the class. Um, this just provides kind of a, a more of a, a, a visual presentation. It's not really accessible, more of just visual. If you look then at the announcements, what I've tried to do here is have videos within the announcements, set announcements for the faculty that are prepared each week. Um, Michelle, you're not seeing, can everyone see what's being presented on the screen now? I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. Okay, Great. okay good. I can see it too. Okay, good. I can see it. Nice. Okay, so. The, um, we wanted, what we did is we increased the font size here to size 14. Um, this is a, a much more, when you're looking at the screen, especially if you have larger screens, which many of our students have now, it's much more clear to see this um, larger font than it is to see a size 12 font, which you can see this course link down here at the bottom. That is the size 12 font. So you can see how much difference it is between the larger font. If we're going to embed pictures in the class, we want to be sure that we're embedding them with um, the alternate text. And the way you can do that in Blackboard is if you go to the image itself and you click, right click on the image and go click on image, then you'll see that there is a bum, 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 an image description and a title that you can put in for this text. This allows the students who are using a reader to see um, what is there. It also 
if this is sent over email, which, you sh which I recommend sending all of your announcements over email, and the email blocks the picture, there will be those words there. So the student will at least know what the picture was supposed to be um, instead of just seeing a blank spot. So that can be very, very helpful. While we're in here, I'm going to talk about headings. If you wanted to, do, when you're looking at what I was talking about earlier with styles, in Word, the styles are in the top bar of the Homes button tab. But in Blackboard, they're right here where it says Paragraph, um, Arial, and the size of the font. The word Paragraph is basically telling an e-reader that this is normal text. If I wanted to put a heading in here, like, um, for next week, I can go in here and I can highlight that and I can say heading. It will now make it bold, but more importantly, it tags this with the word heading. So if someone's in an e-reader, they can say, please read the headings, and it will, it will read out each heading, and they can say, go to the heading for next week and read that, and then it, it will just read that part. So that's why it's important to pay attention to these styles here. You have paragraph, heading, subheading, and I'm not sure what formatted code is. Um, I don't know if it's important, but Aaron or Whitney, do you have anything to say about formatted code? It may not be a big deal. Oh. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I'm not exactly sure what that means either, honestly, but I would, um, venture to guess that you should probably stay within the the headings. Okay. So yeah. Unless so you want to helps. dive into the code, which many of us yeah. do. Exactly. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry I didn't turn off my mic either, so that probably echoed for all of you. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so now I want to show you the course modules. Now we, we are limiting the colors here. We use uh, the City U Burgundy, which is an approved color. And we use black and white, which of course are high contrast colors. And then sometimes we will accent it with the cyan blue for um, links, which you see on the side here is also a uh, approved color. But anytime I want to highlight something, I'm highlighting it with that burgundy color. When you go into the modules, I try to break the modules up. And again, this is what we're doing in SAL. Um, and this is what we found to match the exemplary challenges. But this doesn't necessarily mean that this is what e-learning is requiring. I'm just showing you what we're doing here currently and some of the ways we are breaking things up for our students. So these module banners um, what are um, we had a faculty member that we hired who has a lot of experience with instructional design, and he whipped these up in um, Adobe Photoshop just really quickly, or Adobe Illustrator really quickly. And I have a whole set of them, module one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then all the other ones. And if anybody needs these or wants these, I'll be glad to send them to you. Um, there's some things you need to know about when you insert them, but um, I can go over that if you're interested um, later on. Um, we break things down so that the students, when they're looking down the screen, see their choices broken out. And it makes it easier for the student to kind of go to different sections to get what they need. We do embed the videos in the um, frame, so when the video plays, it plays right in the frame <laughs> that the student is looking at. Required resources have links. Again, we're trying to use the larger font to help them. The weekly activities we keep separate. Now, this is a philosophy that we use. Again, um, some people believe in dividing the, the tasks and the readings up throughout the week. That's totally up to you. We also have additional resources. Now, here is an example of an, a thumbnail as opposed to an embedded. And the thumbnail, I would click on this and it would pop up. But I want to embed it. So let me show you how to embed it. So the first thing I want to do is open it up, and I need the I need the the title, or I can use the URL, which I didn't put in here, which I normally do. But I'm going to just go with the title, and I'm not going to delete this because I don't know if I have the URL. But I'm going to go down here and I'm going to embed it. So if I want to embed it, I go to mashups. Very easy. YouTube video. I search for what I'm looking for. The title usually works, but you can also use the URL. It pops up, Flipped Classroom Explained. I'm not sure that's the video, but let's just say it is. I don't see her face, so we're just going to go with Flipped Classroom Explained video. And then um, I select that, and then here's where I can choose to insert it as a embedded video. 
and I can choose to put the URL in. I always show the URL, that way if a student can't see the embedded video, they'll go to the URL. And then I hit submit, puts a giant yellow box in here, the text is off, don't worry about any of that, it, it sorts itself out when you hit submit. You hit submit, and voila, as quick as you can, now you have an unembedded video instead of the, um, instead of the thumbnail. So the embedded video can then be seen by the students. We, I try to connect to the things the students need. So this will take them to the discussion board if they click on this link. I only link to the discussion board itself. You can link to the forms individually, but I like to link back to the whole discussion board. Again, we're using similar colors. The fonts are big, and we try to use the repetitive nature of um, this is part one, part two. Um, that kind of goes in throughout the classroom when you're looking at the classroom. Okay, so I think I covered everything there. Let's jump back. Does anybody have any questions while we're navigating back? You can either type them or you can share them with the chat, whichever you want to do. Typically not a very good collaborative instructor. I'm much more the sage on the stage, which I know is totally wrong. <laughs> Which leads us into communication. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello, this is Angela. Hi. Would you please show us the steps of embedding the video slowly back again? Because I never did that. And I just want to, if you don't mind. Mind at all. But let me let me table that till the end, of the last part of class, and I'll go through it one more time. That way we'll um, get through all the content, and then we'll do that as a separate thing. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so now moving into, into this, we're moving into communication. And communication is important because the students need to feel that they are, um, that they are, that someone is there for them. Because otherwise you're just a grader who grades their papers. And it's important to understand that when you're grading papers and you're giving feedback, that's really a one-way communication channel. The students can't respond to you within in the current Blackboard way things work. Students can't do a, a post to respond to your feedback. So really that's one way communication. But there's other ways to communicate. The announcements are the big one that most of us use. It is important to email them because otherwise the student may not go to the announcements and then they miss out on something that's important. Embedding videos. I just use my iPhone and I record a video of myself just sitting at my desk. And then I use the tools in the iPhone video to just immediately upload that to YouTube. And um, then I embed it using the embedding tools, which I'll show you again in just a few minutes. Um, that way, the video is there, the students can watch it. But in order to do that, the video needs to be public. Otherwise, you can set the video as unlisted and just provide a link for the students. But this does bring up the, the idea for some people about privacy, and they don't want their videos out there for the world to see. Um, and if that's the case, there are other ways to do that. You can use Kaltura, which is only inside the classroom, and you can use it to record videos as well and to put the videos on the screen um, and embed them. The difference, though, is with Kaltura, the videos cannot be seen outside of the Blackboard shell. So the students need to be logged in in order to watch those videos. So that's the main difference. I did create my own YouTube account as a my own Gmail account as a professor. It's professor.rankin at gmail.com. And I use that professor Gmail to create my YouTube account where I record all my videos. And you can even create channels in YouTube that, that you could just do for grading, for um, audio feedback, those kind of things. You can also just do audio clips. Several of my faculty members just do audio clips that they embed in the announcement that you just, the students hear your voice. They know you're human. They know you're a person. It means a lot to them. I've had professors that that did not score very highly on our um, rubric because they um, didn't respond to the discussion boards regularly, but they got really high marks in the um, students saying that the instructor was engaged and the instructor was um, a part of the classroom. The instructor used technology well. 
they got high marks on those scores because they included videos of themselves and audio of themselves, which really gave the students a sense that they were there. And really, that's what it's all about. Um, again, the feedback is one way, but you can do feedback with um, different formats. We're going to talk about that in just a second. S having Skype hours. Um, so when I'm sitting at my desk, I will often tell students between the hours of 3 and 4, I'm on Skype. You can Skype me if you have any questions. It just, again, they don't have office hours because typically you're remote, so they can't walk up and talk to you. This way, they, can, they know you're there on Skype between 3 and 4. And just like when you have office hours as a brick-and-mortar faculty member, no student usually comes, but the fact that they know you're there is really important to them. And then finally, holding a collaborate session. Collaborate is a great tool to hold a live session. You don't require the students to come to it, but you say, I'm going to be in collaborate tonight discussing the next paper that's coming up. If you want to join me, I'll be there from 5 to 6, but I'll also record it. The students who are available will join you and ask you questions live. The other students can watch it in a recording. Again, this is another way to generate live, you know, real, a live space there for the students to come in and interact with you. The other thing that we're doing in SAL to increase communication is we're doing what we call instructor chat posts. So what we found is the routine, the routine of going in and responding to every student's post every week eventually becomes boring and becomes rote. You space, if the students are writing about the same topic, it's really hard to say different things to each student. And if you say the same thing to each student, they're going to think that you're not actually really caring about what they have to say. So what we've decided is we want to make our interaction with students in the discussion board more like a Facebook um, post. So what we've started trying out, and it's pretty much working, it's been working really well for us, is that we um, have the instructor post a, a post in the form on Monday. And this post from the instructor can be formal, informal, it can be a question, a challenge, a dilemma, a commentary, anything that you want. And then you instruct the students that they need to respond to the instructor post by Wednesday. They can reply to the instructor's post, they make a response. The instructor can reply to them, other students can reply to them, um, other students can reply to the instructor's response. It creates what looks like a, a comment section in a Facebook post. Um, so it allows students to kind of interact in a way that they're familiar with on social media. Then they compose and create their main post by Friday, which is their post in that form. And then they respond to their peers by Sunday. So they still do the normal activity. There's just one more step for them. Now, a lot of our instructors will take what was said in the instructor chat and kind of summarize it in their announcement. Here's what we talked about in the instructor post this week. It's a good way to engage with the students in a way that is manageable, creative, and gives them a sense of you really being there. And you don't have to do this every week, but it's good to have it at certain set points in the class so the students can really have a chance to talk about a topic or, you know, go with a challenge that you give them those kind of things. And part of this is creating a difference for the students in the assignments that you give them. And this is just a different way to communicate with the students to get them to be inactive in your class. These can all be done within a discussion board. Um, I redesigned our um, research um, class, the regular basic research class, and put in a lot of these do activities. And this is from um, William Horton's e-learning by design. And do activities are activities that the student has to actually do something in. And it's different from a report activity where the student reads a book and then reports about it. These do activities have them actually doing things like drills, hands-on work, guided analysis, teamwork. Um, they can do case studies, role-playing, virtual labs. You can do quiz shows, games, jigsaw puzzles, um, mathematical simulations. All these kind of things can be done. The thing is the students interact with these things in a more um, active way instead of a more passive way. And it makes the students feel like things are different. One of the student comments after I redesigned the class was, um, they emailed me and they said, oh my God, this class is so great. I'm so glad we didn't have to do the normal 10 discussion boards. I was so bored with those. 
Well, they still did 10 discussion boards in the class. The difference is they didn't do the discussion boards in the same way. Um, they actually got to like take an article and tear it apart and find, I had the, I, I created a little table, here are 10 things you should be able to find in this article, go find it and write them in and then post it on the discussion board. It's as simple as that, but it gets the student to think, but also do. The do part of it is really important part. And then the video announcements. Again, it's getting the instructor, it's getting the students to feel like you are a part of the classroom. Um, you can record these on your phone or your computer. You can you put them in YouTube. You can use Kaltura. You can embed them in the announcements. But typically, thumbnails work best for announcements because you're going to email them, and the embedding doesn't always work in emails. Um, again, you can create your own announcements channel on YouTube so they can see your announcements um, if you use them again and again. Um, captioning is important because bad captioning can get really crazy. So you want to make sure that you check the captioning. YouTube will automatically caption your video for you. Kiltura automatically captions your video for you. So you want to make sure those captions are very clear and don't say something wrong or dirty or, believe me, they can say some crazy, crazy stuff. You don't want that to happen. For those of you who are very shy and don't want to do a video, you can always do voice over PowerPoint. It's very powerful for students to hear your voice. As, and you can do that either by doing a voice over PowerPoint or you can go to Screencast-O-Matic. Screencast-O-Matic is a great service. There are several types just like this. But with Screencast-O-Matic, you can record a free five-minute video and upload it to YouTube. Um, using a PowerPoint, you can also use your web camera. You can show what's on your screen. If you want to guide your students through um, how to use the, um, the classroom, you can do that with Kaltura. It's really great for that way. Uh, I mean, with Screencast-O-Matic, it's really great for that, giving a guided tour of something. And again, you could just use your voice and um, PowerPoints if you want to. You can also pay, I think, like $15 a year, some really insanely cheap rate, to be able to record longer videos. Okay, you can also do audio and video grading. The um, iPad Blackboard app allows you to actually record a video from your iPad in the grade feedback area that's attached as a separate response to the student that they can watch. You can also record an audio grading, again, that's attached the students can watch. Um, you can use Screencast-O-Matic to do grading. One of our professors takes the student's paper and goes through it using Screencast-O-Matic, highlighting the things that he's discussing in the paper, and then submits that to the students to watch as well. Kaltura is also another way, and I'm going to show you that right now as well. Now, Kaltura isn't my number one thing, so I'm, I may ask for some assistance when we do this. We've got about three more minutes left, so... Let me show you some things, and then I'll also show you the um, embedding video again as well. Okay. Here we go. So, if you're going to grade a student's paper, I don't have an active grade center here. Let me go to a class. I don't know how to show this the best way. But... Let's, let's talk about it in general. Say you're going to a class and you're going to give your students a grade and you go to the feedback section. Well, I'm going to have to show you. Hmm. A dilemma. Let's see. Well, go to the feedback section and when you're in the feedback section, there's a little A. Um, and I'll have to, I'll have to, you'll have to believe this because I'm not sure about the FERPA of, with allowing you to actually see my students in one of my classes. Um, I'm pretty sure you're all city employees, but we don't know that for a fact. So we will we'll bypass FERPA here, but I'm going to show you in general what it would look like. So in your when you're in the um, when you're in the actual grading area, and you go to the feedback, you're going to see a little A at the bottom. When you click the A, it's going to open up just a typical Blackboard interactive screen, which will look like this: this bottom part here, this area down here. So it's going to look like this area here. And one of the things in here is mashups. If you click on that, you can go to Kaltura Media. And what this will allow you to do, you can actually record a video in Kaltura right in the middle of your um, grading area. And um, you, can, you do that by adding a new video. And you can do webcam recording. 
And so you can do a webcam record. It's going to come up. It uses Flash. You have to allow it. Allow it. Allow it. Ooh. Now we're going to get feedback. <sighs> okay. And then voila. You know, I can record this video. I can talk, blah, blah, blah. And I click it. And then it's going, it can, will insert it into the um, area. Okay, let's turn that off. Um, I have a whole bunch of silly ones of these. What's it want now? Okay, save. Okay, forget that. But anyway, so you would embed that in students' grade feedback, and that will allow you to use Kaltura in that way. You would embed, you can embed a YouTube video the same way. Um, you can also just put a link to the YouTube video where you're giving them their grade feedback. In that case, you want to make it unlisted. All right, let me show you one more thing, and then I will go over how to um, do the thumbnail and embedding again for Angela. Um, the other thing is using um, Collaborate. And if you click on Collaborate, um, that's not what you click on. Quick links and Collaborate here. And then you go to Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Let me show you. Thank you, Leela. Have a great night. I'm going to show you a couple of things that you need to know. Your Blackboard Collaborate Classroom is, is embedded into the class. And your room is here. In order to get to the room, you have to click on Get Launch Link. And it will give you a link to join the classroom. Um, you also have settings here that allow you to set some things. There's video that you can watch about that. And eLearning is happy to help you with how to set these settings. But here's what I want to tell you. When you have these collaborate sessions, don't create a session because that can be crazy. Just use the course room. You can record that session, and then the students can access the recordings by hitting this little menu button. Now, they're not going to know that that's a menu button. No one tells them that that's a menu button. So you want to tell them after you've recorded the video, when you post an announcement about it, say, hey, I posted this video. Please go to the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra area. Click on the three bars and go to recordings. You will see all the recordings that we've done in the classroom there. It's one little extra step that we have to do um, to, in order for the students to see our recordings. But again, it's really valuable for the students to see that. OK, so let's go back to embedding videos again. And we'll go through, I'll go through that. Um, and you, this is the same way you would embed a Kaltura video or you would embed any other video. So let's say I want to embed a video. Um, I'm just going to start from scratch here. I'm going to put an item into the classroom. You can also do a video straight, but I like to just have an item because you want to give context to the video. That's another accessibility issue is you want to give context. Here is a video. Um, it is two minutes long and will help you with your paper. You want to tell the students why the heck are they going to watch this video. So you go to mashups. You can do a slide share presentation, a Flickr, YouTube, or Kotura. I'm going to do YouTube. Now, one of the things you can do, you can search for a specific video that you've already found. Or if you want to look around for some videos, you can type in, um, let's say, um, let's say, um, I click Flipped Classroom, and it's going to come up with a list of videos from YouTube about the Flipped Classroom. I find the one I like. There's the, the one I had from before. I click on it, and then I'm, I go to this screen. Now, this is the screen where you make your choices. Um, you can either send it as a thumbnail if it's an announcement, or you can send it as an embedded video. So I click Embed Video. That will allow the student to watch it within the, um, the room. I always want to show the URL because I like for the students to also have the choice to click the URL if they need to. And then I just hit Submit. When I do that, it's going to put this yellow box in here. Um, I give this a title. And I um, just submit it. And when I do that, it's going to add to my module a video that I can just click on and watch right into inside the classroom. 
Okay, any questions? I have one question you mentioned about the iPad Blackboard app. Yes. Is it the one that has the icon that has a pencil? Or is it different? Because I see on my in my store there's four Blackboard apps. It is they're gonna merge those together eventually, mm -hmm. but I believe that it is the app that um it's the Blackboard Grader is what it's called. Okay. Whitney, can you give some more detail on that? Or the one, um, the one with the pencil is actually the student app that's just called Blackboard. Um, the and and then there's an instructor app which has like a little, um, little notepad sort of icon, but you that's actually not available uh, to City U yet. Um, you want to search specifically for um, BB Grader. Okay, and it is only available on uh, iPad. And actually, I have it, and it's it just says BB Grader. There's no icon. Okay. Appreciate here's, it. here's a trick with that, everyone, just so you know. Um, it does not work with rubrics. So if you grade papers with rubrics, the rubrics on the Blackboard Grader really mess up for me. And it could be because we use percentages. I'm not exactly sure, but... Um, it does not work well with rubrics, but you can record video and audio directly to the students' um, feedback really quickly and easily. So it's it's a five one way, ten the other. Hopefully, when they merge it together with this new app, it will be actually useful to also do rubric grading. Any other questions? All right, e. Katrina, I think you have one more slide for us. Uh, thank you, Presley. It was um, a very, very informative presentation. And um, as I said in the beginning of the session, uh, we are recording this presentation, so you can always watch it again because it's a lot of information and it's all really good. So uh, sometime next week, I will post the recording on our faculty development blog. Um, Whitney, Erin, can you please... Um, uh, post the link to the blog um, on the in the chat. So I have just a couple of very quick um, announcements. I will send the uh, I will send our evaluation form sometime tomorrow. So I, I, uh, after each webinar, we ask um, the participants for their feedback so we can improve our webinars. And also, one of the questions is the topics. So if you would like to present on the topic of your choice, please let us know. We are looking for additional presenters. Um, so that's one. And uh, we also have one um, more webinar that we planned for this quarter, and it's the fake news. Uh, this session, we offered this session at the conference, and, and it was very well received. We had a lot of people um, attending that presentation, so we decided to also offer it in a webinar format. And we will have two presenters, our wonderful librarians, Jennifer and Elizabeth. Um, so they will be talking about um, how to help students evaluate uh, resources. So it's a very useful webinar and it will be recorded. If you can't make it, you can always watch the recording on our faculty development blog. And thank you, Whitney, for posting the link to the, uh, posting the registration link to the webinar. And that is all for now. Thank you very much for participating in this um, workshop. Uh, thank you for your questions. And I hope we will see you a, at the end of November and um, in the beginning of December. So we'll offer two sessions on fake news. Thank you very much again and have a great rest of the day. Bye.